here. So this is the second offering of this class. It's a dual class between undergraduate and graduate students, and it is run by my office and the corporate partnerships office. So this has the a unique distinction of really uh, allowing you to talk to very accomplished rising star people at our corporate partners and at our alums and to learn what they learned in school which is useful what they wish they had learned in school and what they also learned in school which is absolutely useless in their professional life journeys so all kinds of questions are par for the course and it's meant to be an interactive session we've had some fantastic speakers last time around and across the board, I am blown away by the kind of the student ratings that I've seen. If my regular lecture classes had those kinds of student ratings, I would that would make me deliriously happy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first session this semester, and uh, it's my great pleasure to have Kanak. She has a very long and accomplished bio, but I think the most important part of that is uh, I had a chance to work with her uh, as she was the PhD student in our group. And then she graduated in 2017. Seems, I wouldn't have guessed it's that far back, but it is. And then she's been at Adobe Research in San Jose, California. So she's done this fantastic balancing act of computer systems work and machine learning work. So she's been using machine learning technologies to build efficient, reliable computing systems. And uh, she's published a lot during her PhD as well. And then uh, we are really looking forward to hearing this uh, fantastic career progression that she's been having even over this just last six years. Uh, Kanak, would you have anything to add in terms of the metadata before we launch on to your session? No, I think you covered it all. All right, so you have the floor, Kanak. And just logistically, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and I will have an appropriate time when I will pause Kana and give you the chance to ask the question. So if possible, when you're asking the question, please turn on your video. It's not. It's nice not to have to just speak to a wall. Uh, and then you can ask your questions. If for some reason you're in a really noisy spot and you cannot ask the question yourself, indicate that when you post it on the chat, in which case I'm going to ask the question on your behalf. All right, Kana, with that, you have the floor. So let me share my screen. So you can uh, see the slides now, right? I don't see it yet. Oh, can you see them now? It's coming up. Yes, I can see it now. All right. Perfect. Great. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. So hello, everyone. I am uh, a research scientist at Adobe, and I've, uh, I'm very happy to be here and to talk to everyone and share some of my research, which is at the intersection of machine learning and systems. Uh, so I have tried to represent it using these two ellipses, where most of my work at Adobe um, either falls in this first ellipse of building high-performing ML-based applications or um, leveraging ML techniques to develop efficient systems. And uh, I'm going to share some representative work from uh, each of these two domains today. So specifically, I'm going to be talking around um, our work around developing a scalable and distributed online recommendation system. And I'm also going to be talking about the work uh, regarding designing um, cloud resource usage forecasting algorithm. Um, so let's start. Uh, so this first work is around one of Adobe's products called Adobe Target. Um, so Adobe Target uses uh, multi-armed bandits to perform A-B testing. And these multi-armed bandits are used to 
automatically allocate traffic to the most successful experience for increased conversion and revenue. Uh, however, designing distributed bandit systems uh, at large scales, which also have high performance, is challenging. And I'm going to share some of the key techniques that we used in this um, in this work. So um, recommendation systems are commonly deployed in web services such as Netflix, YouTube, and Amazon, and we all have um, we have we all have worked with them. Um, they provide users with suggestions on what the users should watch or shop next. And uh, the important thing to note, though, is that for these systems, the user preferences, content, and set of active users could change very rapidly. This could change within minutes. And so offline training on stale data can generate suboptimal results. Um, in addition, the large scale at which these systems operate demand algorithms that can learn online and that can learn fast. And uh, bandit algorithms are often used in recommendation systems for this purpose. Um, so how do these bandit algorithms for recommendation systems operate? Um, so there is a bandit agent, uh, which is our learner here. and uh, for a user, the agent picks an item from an item set to recommend uh, to the users and then observes the feedback. So if the user clicks on the item, for example, then the agent receives a reward. And the agent is inclined to pick actions that provide higher rewards. And in this way, it learns a good user item mapping after several interactions with the user. However, at scales of billions of users and billions of possible recommend recommendable items, the data and compute requirement of these algorithms can easily exceed the capacity of a single node. Uh, and most of the bandit algorithms are serial, which can cause severe performance degradation. Uh, the other challenge for distributed bandit algorithms is that um, they require editing of a lot of shared user information, which can lead to high synchronization and communication costs while developing a distributed algorithm. Uh, so in terms of previous solutions that have looked at uh, algorithms for scale, there are two state-of-the-art algorithms. One is called as CLUB. Um, and the other one is called as uh, DCCB, which is a distributed algorithm for CLUB. So CLUB is a single node banded algorithm for recommendations. And for the scale aspect, what it does is it uses a online clustering algorithm so that uh, the recommendations are then based on the cumulative properties of the users in the cluster. and uh, there is no explicit data transfer since it only runs on a single node. Um, so the drawback is that it runs on a single node, but there is no data transfer. On the other hand, for DCCB, it is a distributed algorithm and there are multiple learning agents. And what happens in DCCB is that every agent communicates with a randomly selected peer to learn the global view. And uh, it then transfers large user interaction history buffers uh, between the agents. So this is exactly the uh, drawback of DCCB that it creates a large um, communication bottleneck that exacerbates when there are a large number of users. Uh, and also information is shared only with uh, single peer at a time. And this also slows down the cluster discovery and accuracy. To handle the drawbacks of these existing systems. Um, so uh, I, I have one question at this point. 
Sure. So maybe for the audience, you want to explain a little bit more of the importance of a recommendation system in your line of business. And the second question is the two prior things that you mentioned, were these commercial solutions already at Adobe or were these more research solutions? Yeah, so the for the first one, uh, as I said, that recommendation systems are used uh, in a lot of places uh, within Adobe, outside Adobe. So for example, in, the, in YouTube, uh, recommendations are provided um, as to what video you should watch next or what are similar videos based on your um, view history and also other a lot of other features that are used from uh, from for for example uh, user information and so on um, at Adobe uh, recommendation systems are deployed in a lot of systems as well uh, within Adobe target they are used so bandit algorithm is used to select uh, what experiences uh, should be shown to the user to maximize their experience uh, maximize their uh, maximize several things during their experience um, in terms of the two algorithms that i showed those uh, so the first one is not so neither of them are really like uh, products but they are they are research based solutions and variants of them are often deployed in products got it thank you yeah so um so the three key techniques that we used to overcome the drawbacks of the existing state of the art uh were the first one where we balanced user-based and cluster-based interactions. So, um, so this club dynamically switches between user-based recommendation and cluster-based recommendation based on the available data. So when user information is sparse, um, it leverages cluster specific information, but when abundant user information, user specific information is available, uh, then that information is used. And this allows this club to achieve higher accuracy. Uh, our algorithm also frequently rebalances between the user and the cluster rounds. So while balancing these user-based and cluster-based rounds on available information does improve accuracy, there is also a need to have low latency. And the second key technique that we employ is identifying opportunities to exploit parallelism. Uh, so during the user-based interaction processing, interactions across user are processed in parallel. And uh, during the cluster-based processing, interactions across clusters are uh, occur in parallel. And then merging of this information is also done in parallel by exploiting tree reduction style parallelism. And the clustering is also done in parallel over the graph. So for each of the key components of the algorithm, we exploit opportunities uh, for parallelism. And while parallelism and information balancing achieve good benefits at scale, the data transfer is still a bottleneck. So uh, this third technique is used to reduce the data transfer through a global information merge and eliminating the buffers. So um, as I had said that in DCCB, each node shares information with a single random peer node. And uh, this is shown in this um, buffer uh, on the left side where the length of the buffer depends on how many interactions are stored in the history buffer. And uh, overall, there are if there are n users, this buffer itself scales with the number of users. Um, and this, uh, this is what causes the communication bottleneck. So, what we do is we don't keep any buffers. Uh, in this club, we do a global information merge before the clustering step. 
uh, and uh, in this way, the cumulative data shared in this club is significantly lower than DCCB. Um, I have included some experimental um, and evaluation results that we did in a test environment. And uh, the table here shows these data sets and the number of user interactions for each of them. And the first four uh, data sets here are real benchmarks. Uh, we also created a synthetic data set to represent a much larger volume of uh, user interaction history to match the requirements of a modern recommendation system. And uh, these data sets have varying number of users and items. And we also show the, show the environment setup for our test cluster. So uh, first we evaluated the performance of this club over DCCB in terms of the speed up. And the y-axis here shows the speed up of this club over DCCB and the x-axis shows the data set. And uh, as you can see, this club outperforms DCCB on all data sets. And the geo mean speed up of this club over DCCB is 8.9x. We also evaluated the scalability of this club and DCCB on our largest real benchmark data set, which is Yahoo, and our even larger synthetic data set. The y-axis here shows the speed up achieved compared to the 64 core variant. And the x-axis shows the number of cores that were used to run um, the setup, which goes from 64 to 512. And uh, over all of these data sets, uh, this club has uh, an average scaling efficiency of 81.2%. Uh, finally, we also compared the reward uh, performance. So the prediction performance of this club and DCCB and club over all of the data sets. So here, higher the ratio of the cumulative reward obtained uh, against a random policy, the better. So better is the prediction performance. And the red line here shows the um, performance of this club, which is higher than both DCCB and club. And uh, on an average, we found that this club achieves 14.5% uh, higher prediction performance. Uh, so the key takeaway of this work um, is to show how we designed this distributed and parallel multi arm banded based online recommendation system, looking at system level optimizations and uh, built a system that is scalable, parallel, and still achieves higher performance. Um, the second key takeaway is that the communication bottlenecks in DCCB uh, were something that we needed to uh, overcome to help uh, deploy such an algorithm in production. And uh, we could do this by mixing cluster-based and user-based recommendation systems and I'd still achieve higher performance and scalability. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about how, uh, how we build efficient systems by leveraging machine learning methods. And uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about a work that uh, we built, a probabilistic graph-based forecasting framework for resource usage forecasting in the cloud. So uh, forecasting techniques uh, are used quite widely in enterprises uh, for forecasting cloud resource usage. And uh, this is a very this is a very important area because performance of the cloud services invariably depends on the provisioned resources. So 
fewer resources can result in performance degradation and costly SLA violations, while assigning more resources leads to poor resource utilization and wasted money. And both of these scenarios are undesirable. Um, in addition, most of these cloud services exhibit seasonal patterns and undergo striking variations in the load. Um, and so provisioning resources for peak demand often wastes resources. Uh, so accurate forecasting is necessary for a variety of enterprise related cloud resource allocation decisions, as well as um, scheduling decisions. Um, so there are some unique challenges for cloud resource forecasting. So the first one is that due to adoption of uh, microservices and containerization for uh, ease of development and portability, there are just a large scale of cloud services that are developed and deployed every day. Uh, and there is a need to model the, these large collection of time series. And uh, for these cloud services, there are a variety of resources that uh, need to be uh, monitored, such as CPU usage, memory usage, um, GPU utilization, um, and other kinds of resource usage that needs to be monitored. So this multiplicity of resources and the large scale uh, of development of these cloud services necessitates uh, a solution that can model these large collection of um, time series. The second challenge is the relationship between these services. So the, on the right side of the slide here, uh, we've shown uh, Google cluster data set, uh, the usage of the Google cluster data set. And uh, as can be seen on the figure, some of the series are related to each other. For example, they might be belonging to the same cluster or have some workflow dependencies, uh, but some of these series are not related to each other at all. So while modeling a collection of uh, such time series, we also want to model the unique relationship between the time series. And uh, in terms of existing work in forecasting time series, uh, it could be summarized in um, two, two important blocks. So one is point processing, where these solutions provide a single expected value of what the, the prediction is. And ARIMA or exponential smoothing uh, are examples of such point forecasting methods. However, they fail to utilize the relationship between the time series. Um, there is recent work among probabilistic forecasting. So in this category, these methods provide a prediction as a distribution than a single value. And uh, examples are deep AR and deep factors. Uh, but, and while these methods do outperform conventional uh, time series forecasting methods, they, they either assume complete dependence or complete independence among the time series involved. So this is uh, not true in our scenario as we saw in the earlier figure. So some of the series were related and some were not. And uh, hence we designed a general and extensible graph-based probabilistic forecasting met framework called graph, uh, graph DF. And uh, I'm going to describe our model at a very high level. So we used a graph neural network to allow the modeling of this dependence among the time series. And uh, we used a combination of two models, a global model and a local model. Uh, the graph which describes the relationship between the time series can explicitly be given as an input to this model or derived 
using um, kernel functions on the time series values of the resource types. Um, and uh, the proposed model then consists of these two components, the global, fact, the global model and the local model. Uh, so the global model learns k dominant global factors among the time series, which are then linearly combined with the learned weights and a local model that learns the random relational uh, effect specific to each time series. Uh, so with the help of this global and local model, we achieve uh, both our uh, desired goals. One is that we can learn the K dominant factors for this collection of series. And second is we can also uncover uh, the relationships between time series that actually share an edge. Uh, this can also be useful when we don't have enough information for a particular um, time series. And um, the design of graph BF is modular in the sense that both the global and the local models could use a variety of models according to the requirement. So uh, we used a graph convolutional recurrent neural network for these two models, but it can also be substituted with a simpler um, recurrent neural network. And uh, so we evaluated graph DF on two data sets. One was the Google data set and one was the Adobe data set. And the tables here show the characteristics of the data sets in terms of number of vertices, edges, average degree uh, of connectivity, et cetera. And these have a representative workload and also have diverse patterns that we wanted to evaluate. So we evaluated the forecasting performance and also the scalability of uh, the different methods. and. We uh, show we have shown the performance of graph DF, um, our method with other state of the art probabilistic forecasting methods such as um, N beats, MQR, and N deep AR and deep factors. And uh, here the table shows the mean absolute percentage error with different quantile values. So lower is better. And for all of the data sets, uh, graph DF models outperform the met other methods. Uh, the GG variant is the one where we use GCRN for both the global and the local models. We also analyze the runtime, the training runtime, the inference runtime, and the scalability of all, all the methods. Um, in terms of the training time, graph DF is significantly faster than the other methods. Uh, note that the GR variant is uh, the one that is fastest because instead of having uh, a complete graph as an input, it, uh, it has the complete graph as an input which already has the explicit dependencies instead of leveraging all pairwise time series. And, uh, Graph DF also scales linearly to the increasing training set size. Um, and yeah, so the takeaway of this work is that using probabilistic graph based forecasting methods, um, you can achieve higher forecasting performance while also being enabled to encode, um, while also enabling encoding of. Uh, complex time series relationships. And the global model here learns the complex nonlinear time series patterns, while the local model can learn local effects on the individual time series using the time series of the nodes and their immediate neighbors. Um, and this enables us to develop an algorithm that can improve forecasting accuracy. And then also uh, feed this downstream to allow the development of either capacity planning or scheduling decisions, such as like when the utilization is going to be lower, you could schedule some opportunistic batch-based 
uh, workloads and so on. Yeah, so that is what I have. Thank you, Kanak. So there is a flood of questions that have come through, many of them on the professional side uh, rather than on the deeply technical side. So I will start this off by uh, repeating some questions that I've already seen. And there are some common patterns. So I'm integrating questions which are in the same common theme. Uh, so one question is, what was the motivation behind you coming back from industry to join the PhD program? Yeah, so um, yeah, so I completed my master's in um, computer information technology department at Purdue um, in 2012. And uh, I went to the industry after getting the master's degree. Um, I worked at Salesforce for a year and I was working on database query optimization. Um, so through the interactions that I had during this year, um, I realized that I wanted to have a more research oriented career arc. So I did want to apply research for industrial scale problems, but I also wanted to have uh, uh, contribute academically. And so I thought that I should come back to Purdue for a PhD. And I'm very glad that you did. Yeah, I'm glad to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see if in the chat there are any questions. Okay, no questions in chat yet. So would anybody want to uh, have anything synchronously ask? Yeah, I have one question. Um, so um, a, a general question as to what are some important skills uh, that you learned in your PhD that helps you even today in your work? Yeah. And also tell us all the classes that you found are quite useless in your work life. Yeah, so um, I think there are probably three or four uh, like top uh, top things that I feel are very have been very relevant. Um, so one of them is um, this ability of doing structured thinking. So um, so most of the PhD uh, training or um, I feel the experience during PhD is about understanding a complex problem and trying to break it down into smaller manageable problems, which uh, you find the solutions for and then try to fit them together to still uh, be able to meet the constraints of the larger complex problem. Um, so I think this ability of breaking, thinking about the complex problem in terms of um, these smaller problems and breaking them down uh, was one uh, key learning that I had. Um, the second, I would say, is communication skills. So communication skills are extremely important while collaborating with uh, the peers on your team or even uh, on folks across teams on while preparing presentations. Uh, other kinds of uh, documents like papers and patents. So communication skills uh, is something that I learned during my PhD that I find uh, extremely useful. Um, and I think the third thing I would say is uh, the ability to look at a problem from different angles and also the ability to look at a solution at diff from different angles and see what is critically missing in what scenarios. Um, so it's not like there is one solution and it fits all possible uh, scenarios. There are always things that you need to relearn or rethink about. And I think this like scientific attitude of questioning the solution and finding out what is missing in what scenario is um, is the the last the third thing there are several but i think these are the top 3 that come to my mind um in terms of classes that 
I think, uh, so I actually really enjoyed all the classes that I took at Purdue and especially I like the uh, maths and stat classes. Uh, then I also like a lot of seminar uh, classes that I took at Purdue as well as the like the computational biology ones. I, yeah, I don't think that any class I took was not useful. <laughs> Uh, there is a question uh, by Ernesto on Piazza. Ernesto, you are here? Yes, I'm right here. Actually, I have my camera on. Okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'm actually taking another class regarding like a kind of just a general overview of like the patent process. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was interested in, in knowing is like, uh, you know, had you and your co-inventors on any of the patents had to do had to go through any sort of like legal hurdles in order to to get those through have you faced have you been in in litigation at all uh you know since you've been doing that stuff and let me broaden Ernesto's question some so how important is patenting in your line of work yeah so uh so let me try to uh, briefly provide an understanding of uh, the patent program at Adobe and generally at all industries. So patent portfolios are built by industries to for several different reasons. So it is not only uh, for like offensive purposes for like litigating and finding if someone is infringing on your patent, but it's also for uh, like defensive purposes, uh, being able to later sort of point out that we already had a lot of work in this area and these are all our patents in this area. And the third reason is to sort of uh, promote a competitive culture of working on a lot of innovative work. So, uh, and this, all of this is done proactively. So, the patents that are uh, that we work on are relevant to some products, but they are not. Not all of the patents are going into any particular product immediately. So there is a proactive nature to them, but uh, they are definitely relevant to business and are high quality. And um, yeah, the chief purpose is that nobody should copy them and take away credit for, from the products. So, uh, so it is fairly important uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of uh, like a research uh, organization level objectives. Uh, in terms of the litigation, so, uh, so there has been no litigation process and Usually what we do in the overall patent process is we come up with uh, a draft for the attorneys to go through where we discuss what the invention is, what uh, what is the key thing that we want to patent. And uh, then they come up with specific claims that are unique to the, uh, unique to the whole invention and then it is filed as a patent. Very good. Um, thank you, Kanak. So the next one question is, um, when you're transitioning from uh, an academic environment where you're doing your PhD for some years, and then you get into the workforce, what are some of the things that really helped you in getting a running start in that? Um, so I think as... Uh, so during this journey of moving from uh, being a fresh PhD graduate to uh, an industrial researcher, uh, I think uh, knowledge of Adobe products and uh, what are the different ways in which uh, I could contribute in terms of, for example, developing high performance solutions for these products or uh, understanding the product itself were very important. The second thing I would say was meeting with those specific teams 
um, that were working on the products uh, and also meeting with the existing researchers who were working uh, with those teams was also very critical in terms of uh, understanding what are the current uh, features on the roadmaps of the products and what are the current pain points of the products. Um, that was also important. Uh, so, so the way our uh, research team operates is that we collaborate with the product teams to transfer our research ideas into the product. Um, and so it is very critical to have a good working relationship with them. That is one. But the second is that uh, we should be able to justify what the research idea uh, going into the product does for the product. So understanding their roadmap and um, their pain points um, was extremely important. Yeah, I think I feel those two were the main things. Great. So several people had this question for you. So with that one answer, I think you've clarified several questions. Uh, David, who's on the call. David, you had a question that on Piazza, if you can go ahead and post, uh, mention that now, and you can turn on your video as you're asking. Uh, hello, Professor. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, hello, Doctor. Um, um, I have a question. Uh, actually, I'm my concentration is in power systems. So um, I, I don't have a background in machine learning, but uh, I would like to know uh, about an opinion. Uh, what do you think, um, what's the next step uh, about machine learning uh, in, a, in a near future? Um, uh, this, uh, these, algorithms, these algorithms are um, ready to be created, create their own or take uh, like critical decisions, like uh, I said, uh, maybe life or death situation, or this is already happened. And that, uh, that would be my question. Thank you. So, so you're asking, uh, Kanak has been using machine learning in order to make computing systems more efficient. So you're saying, can machine learning be used to generate artistic content, creative content. That's right, yes. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, generative AI is already, uh, the there are already models that exist that can generate all kinds of um, data, including audio, video, code. So uh, for example, I'm not sure if you are following the news regarding chat GPT, but um, ChatGPT is an example of a generative AI model, which has this dialogue style uh, method to provide answers to a variety of questions. And then it uses this dialogue style to sort of interact with you and understand the question more and then provide uh, more suitable answers. Uh, it can also generate code. It's a large language model that has been trained on a lot of open source code so it can generate code for you um, there are other models um, so there is dali 2 that um, that is a diffusion model that can generate images uh, based on textual descriptions um, there are also models to generate videos uh, so so these models definitely take a lot of inspiration from the data that they have been trained on but they also generate some completely new content. Um, so yeah, so regarding your question, there are already models that do that. And it's a very rapidly growing field. Uh, and it is already making significant impact in industry. Very good. Um, Mithun, you have a question. If you are around, please come on video and you can ask yourself. OK, hi. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my question was that I saw many of the solutions. So are these based on reinforcement learning techniques or the algorithms are based on reinforcement learning? Because I saw the agents and there's environment. So I don't have much of a background in machine learning, but I just wanted to know, uh, like, are some courses like reinforcement learning and all required to have a career in this field? Um, yeah, so the, the, the first work that I presented was uh, using bandit algorithms uh, and bandit algorithms is uh, a part of reinforcement learning. Uh, so, so it is a reinforcement learning technique. And uh, 
I think uh, getting familiar with reinforcement learning is is a good idea in general. Um, yeah, I think learn as much as you can, I would say. Uh, but it's not a prerequisite. Uh, so I think I would like to come back to what I said. So I think you'll always have to learn new things and adopt, adapt to new changes that are going to come in the future. You probably won't be in a position to have completed all required courses for all uh, the new technologies that come up. But you should have the ability to learn them on your own and um, think about um, how you could apply them or think about the pros and cons of those algorithms and so on. So this is a very key question that comes up time and time again with many of our industry speakers. So what is this balance between learning on the job versus the more formal learning that you've gone through in school? And when you're learning on the job, do you say, for this next week, I'm going to sit down with this textbook and this Coursera course and just learn this from beginning to end? Or is this more in bite-sized pieces? For the next two hours, you're going to read up some algorithm in order to do the job that you're doing. Where does it fit within this whole spectrum? So I think it depends on uh, individual preferences. Uh, I sometimes like to do the complete Coursera courses on specific topics that uh, I'm interested in, uh, but all like courses are not available all the time. Uh, so, and as you actually use them in a particular work, you automatically gain more insight in it. Uh, so, so the course helps you to, uh, or automatically provides you all of the aspects that you need to think about while while learning a particular topic and um, also the questions and the exercises uh, sort of make sure that you also have the applied skill gained uh, versus learning without doing these courses you um, you sort of discover them while you are applying them to the work very good all right. When you're having fun, you lose count of time. So we have come to the end of our time. I must thank Kanak for uh, making us all very proud with the career that she's already having, making me proud as a PhD advisor. But also, I think what is particularly heartening is that she took the time and the effort to come back and address her students. It's a perfect way of actually giving back to the next generation of the learners. So I'm very appreciative of that. And with that, let's give a round of applause to Kanak. Uh, next week, we are going to have another very exciting speaker who is uh, a much more senior person. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, his life, professional life journey. He's a very high person, uh, high profile person at Xerox and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So you're going to have a bit of a whiplash as we go through this semester. You're going to see people like Kanak who are rising stars, and then you're going to see some more established people. But through all of this, we're going to have this wonderful conversation. So keep the questions coming uh, on Piazza as well as synchronously. Uh, with that, we will end this session here today. All right. Thank you. Bye, Kanak.